Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network, coming to you from the TeacherCast studios since 2011. Join us each week as we bring you the latest educational news, ed tech updates, and hottest interviews with today's most influential leaders in education. And now, for your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Teacher Cast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making Teacher Cast your home for professional development. This is Educational Podcasting Today, the show for podcasters, by podcasters, for podcasters, and even about podcasters. I am so happy that you guys are here. It has been such a long time since we created a show. Hope you had a chance to check out our episode last week featuring the great Jake Miller and uh, talking about how he created Edu Duct Tape, how his podcast is going, and a little bit about what we did throughout the pandemic as podcasters. Guys, if you are looking to be featured on a show and have your podcast featured out, head on over to educationalpodcasting.com. Let us know. Fill out our form. We would love to feature you. Today, I have a fantastic guest, formerly from Canada, currently from the great state of Washington. And she's going to be talking all about how she has not only created a show, built a brand, has an amazing system for recording and editing. But I got to tell you, I learned a lot from this episode, and I hope you do too. Of course, if you're looking to find more information, you can head on over to educationalpodcasting.com. And if you want to bring stuff like this into your classroom we recently overhauled podcasting with students.com where you can find all of our information about how to create shows lesson plans for shows all the content on there is getting refreshed re-updated and we're also bringing back our facebook group you can head on over to our educational podcasting facebook group All of that stuff is over at educationalpodcasting.com, and we hope you guys have a great time checking that out and sharing this with your friends. My guest today is an educator with an amazing spin to her podcast. She does a show called Lesson Impossible, an exploration of educational innovation, where she introduces her listeners to podcasts kind of like special agents. I've been listening to this show for a while now. Every single episode, you can't help but leave yourself going, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> I want to bring on today, Miss Aviva Levin. Aviva, how are you today? Welcome to Educational Podcasting today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm doing really well. I am so thrilled to have you on the show. I'm so thrilled to meet you. Tell the audience a little bit about who the educator is behind the microphone. So I am a French and social studies teacher, and I taught for 10 years in British Columbia, Canada, and then I moved to Washington State in the U.S., and uh, I don't know how much you know about immigration, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. And so knowing that I'd have some time before I could find myself back in the classroom, I was really looking for a way to stay connected to education, but also learn more about the context that I was now going to be situating myself into. And so podcasting just seemed like the way to do it, where I got a chance to ask people questions, which is one of my favorite things to do in the world. And they answered me and then I got to share those answers. And so that was the impetus. And I've just been going uh, since 2019. Was this a difficult decision? Did you look around for other ways to be creative and you landed on podcasts? Or have you always been a podcast listener and thought, let me put my toe in this one? You know, the funny thing is that uh, I was recently like part of moving and then we moved again is you bring all your junk with you. And (laughs) so uh, I am a bit of an educational hoarder in that I've kept every like project and paper that I've ever done since probably elementary school. So as I'm going through and like, oh, that's an interesting project on, you know, Egyptian mummies from grade five, I found um, a career, like a little career project that I had to do when I uh, was probably about 13 and it said radio broadcaster on it. And I had been really interested in radio broadcasting. And I remember my like advisor for the project being like, oh, that's a dying industry. Like you want to you want to think elsewhere. And then, you know, sure enough, a decade and a half later, podcasting is the replacement. So the germ was there from very young, I think. 
you remember doing your first show? Uh, oh, yeah. I Well, I so like I think a lot of podcasters, I did a whole bank. I had all, all these episodes booked. Uh, and starting off before uh, COVID, too, it was all live. So I'd arrive and I'd be sweaty and I'm really bad with directions. And so I'd be nervous. So I'd either be arriving just on time or like super early and then go in there, go into people's classrooms, start setting up my equipment, pulling out, you know, the microphone, the laptop, the little sound buffer, all that. And uh, yeah, I felt... I think like a lot of people, like my first year in the classroom, a little bit of imposter syndrome, but you fake it till you make it. And that is great advice for anybody. You know, we've talked about it on this show before. Your first couple episodes are going to be what your first couple of episodes are. I, I noticed that on your feed, you have a trailer. Was that the first thing you did or did you add the trailer down the road and kind of stick it at the beginning? How, how did all that uh, production come about? That's a good question. I... I am definitely a planner. So I probably read like, I mean, maybe 10, 15 blogs about podcasting, listened to podcasts about podcasting. And so had a big, you know, checklist of all the things I wanted before I even published the first episode. So one of the things, like I said, was I knew that I had to have a whole bank of episodes so that I wasn't always relying on guests who might flake out or have something else going on. And I knew I wanted a trailer to entice people. I knew I wanted really good art uh, and branding to, to get people's visual appeal before they even heard me. So I had all of that ready to go before the first episode. Your show is different. It's produced. It sounds amazing. Thank you. And talk to us a little bit about how this show came about right lesson impossible um were you inspired by the restaurant shows were you inspired by <laughs> by the tv show how did you come up with the concept and put the whole thing together i the concept really came from my observation as a teacher who was trying to make change with other teachers trying to make change. And often I felt like we were like sleeper agents almost where you'd go into a meeting and um, you know, everyone would be saying the status quo and then someone would be like, Hey, has anybody thought of restorative justice <laughs> or has anybody thought of ungrading? And, but also just this feeling that like we are very much as teachers, especially in climates where teachers work and skill and professionalism isn't valued, we very much like a secret agent changing the world behind the scenes and no one knows. Sometimes it feels like that. And sometimes even as a teacher, you don't see the repercussions of the work that you're doing for a really long time. And I, I really liked the idea of creating a community of agents where I speak to my listeners we're interviewing, you know, a special agent who's a specialist, but you as a listener, you're an agent too. You are given a mission every episode. Uh, and if you choose to accept this lesson, you are able to then implement this new strategy, think about teaching in a new way, that kind of thing. I think that's fantastic. That's awesome. How is that working out? How is your community building? What type of response have you get? Are you, do you have people emailing you with their agent number? Uh, no, nobody's emailing me with an agent number yet. I will say that I have um, the first fan mail that I ever got. Um, my husband printed it out and framed it for me. Um, and that That's was awesome. a big a big deal for me to be like, oh yeah, like I'm not just speaking into the void. I don't know if you feel this way sometimes, but you know, because podcasting is a one-way medium, sometimes yeah. it does feel like you're just throwing something into the void. And so to know that the void was looking back in a really positive way was was good. Um, I have gotten, like, the first time I had my, my first reply guy, um, which I don't know if you know that term, but the, the internet's uh, well actually dude who likes to tell women about their vocal fry or about how they could, you know, be more, you know, it usually starts out as like, you know, you're doing really good work, but have you ever considered that you giggle too much? Uh, have you ever considered blank? Um, 
so that was also a little bit of an achievement too, to be like, aha, my first reply guy. <laughs> you, you found an edu Karen. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> It, it you know you you just brought up a couple ideas here you know one of the things one of the reasons i got into podcasting was because um being a musician being a performer you do love doing something on stage and you get that instant gratification of a smile or a applause or something like that and and when you are podcasting you talk into a microphone and you don't know right and and i've always said analytics are just empty hugs they're there <laughs> they're nice you know someone's there but you don't feel it and yeah, I think we all know what that feeling is when somebody comes up at a conference and says, I listened to you or, Hey, you know, you did X, Y, and Z and it helped me out. I mean, uh, look, I'm sure anybody that's out there listening to this as a podcaster, bring that feeling on constantly. Like I love hearing that th because of this or because of an interview that had some reaction in somebody's life. I never feel like I, I always bring those to your to your podcasters let them know that they're out there Ooh. yeah something that i've started doing a lot um my start podcasting was now i leave a lot of reviews if i come across a podcast that i like i leave a review um and then i started blogging in a companion to the podcast and then i used to be like the biggest lurker in the world on people's blogs now I comment. If I read a post and I like it, I comment. If I'm like, oh, I like this, but I tweak it this way, I comment. Because now I know what it's like to be on the other end of that and to, again, feel like, oh, is anybody reading this? <laughs> what? Talk to us a little bit about your production, right? Because we've been getting questions frequently about how do we do things? You know, what do you record? Uh, what's your What's your microphone? Um, talk to us a little bit about the technical setup when you record, because um, so much has happened since the pandemic, right? Stuff's getting bigger, stuff's getting smaller, stuff's getting cheaper. Um, platforms have changed. Let's break this down. How do you record your show? So from the technical standpoint, uh, I'd say it's fairly basic. Uh, I have a Yeti microphone, which I really like. I originally bought it because of its portability um, and I continue to use it. I have added uh, Ophonics um, and, oh, I forget what they're called, but it's basically like a spit guard um, <laughs> on top of it. And it's surrounded by uh, a little sound dampening U-shaped uh, sound dampener. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently recording in a, in a walk-in closet um, because not only is it good for storing all my podcast stuff, but for like sound dampening, I find that really good having clothes around. Um, and then it's just connected to my, my Mac, um, in terms of the recording, because the majority of my recording is still done online. Uh, I use Zencaster. The reason why I like Zencaster is that a, you, you can start with the, uh, the video on. So I'll see my guest introduce ourselves, but then I like to turn the video off. Um, and the reason I like to do that is because I find so much of communication is around nonverbal cues. And so when I take that away, the person is then reaching for those verbal cues. They're not waiting for me to nod or smile. And so I, I find that more engaging and transferable to to the podcast audience. Mm -hmm. And then Zencaster is also my preferred because I, I do edit. I know that's very controversial. I've had lots of debates with people, but um, I, I feel like if people are going to give me the, the time to talk to them, I owe it to them to, to at least edit out the, the most awkward of pauses. Mm -hmm. I also think this gives my guests uh, a feeling of freedom to be a lot more uh, open with what they're going to say because then they have the option when we're done to email me and be like, hey, can you take that part out? Um, yeah, feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I love where you're going with this. Your, your microphone, are, are you on the Yeti right now? You sound I am. fantastic. Oh my oh, goodness. Thank you. I, um, I, I keep my Yeti behind me. I know people can't see this, but I always keep that there. So whenever I'm doing my show here with you, it's always in the back. <laughs> Which for, for me, it's kind of symbolic. That means never forget where you came from. That was my first microphone. So I'm, I'm always looking ahead. I know this yeah. sounds really, really weird, right? But 
even though I'm looking forward right at you in the rear view is always like, again, it's that never forget where you came from. So it's always right there next to my Mickey Mouse Lego. But you said that you were recording your Yeti um, and, and your closet. Like you're not the first person I've had on the show that's sitting in a closet. If it works, great. Right. And you said you record online with Zencaster. I didn't quite catch. What do you use to edit your platform? Oh, so I, um, and then I'll add the other thing I really like about Zedcaster is that it's a individual um, track. So Got each it. guest gets their own track, um, which I know that if people aren't wanting to do a lot of editing, that it, the tracks will misalign and that can be very frustrating. But because I'm cutting up the tracks, I probably do hundreds of cuts in in an interview that it the misalignment doesn't bother me. And I just actually, I import it into GarageBand. Um, you know, I watched some YouTube tutorials on GarageBand. I'm not doing anything fancy with like fading or mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. And so I find it to be a very intuitive program for me. So you're editing in Zencaster, you're editing oh, also- I'm uh, editing in GarageBand. I just in record Garage in Band. Zencaster, yeah. Pulling your stuff down. Uh, what's your publishing platform? What, uh, Lipson, Blueberry, what do you have? I use Podbean. Okay. Uh, and they've been- you know, I've had no problems with Podbean. What have you learned in this process? We all go through the transformation of, okay, what do I need? How does it work? What are you using? But eventually you find yourself in a rhythm. And somewhere in there, you do start to create your rhythm based off of your own personal way of life your way of thinking and i and i say this because so often at times you see in facebook groups you know wow what application do you use and my response is well how much time do you have do you want to re do you want to edit in five minutes or do you want to edit in five hours like all of these answers really do depend on the person who's doing the job right so what have you learned about yourself through this process of creating the process or editing talk to us a little bit about what you found out about yourself in the last year or so um i'd say my scheduling has gotten fairly erratic mm -hmm. um you know i'm finishing up my masters i've got stuff family stuff happening uh and i think like a lot of teachers when i and and this is just a reflection on i think on our own journeys around mental health and grace for ourselves, I would have like pushed myself to let's say stay up really late to finish uh, editing something. And now I'm just sort of like, you know what? So it'll be another week without an episode. That's okay. Good for you. Um, and, <laughs> and that's why this show hasn't been alive in three years. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, and like, I, I in no way resent any of, the podcasters I follow when I don't get things. I don't even really keep a schedule in my mind. I'm not like, oh, it's 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Why isn't so-and-so publishing? And so it's very much like this is a labor of love and it it goes out when it goes out. Um, I think I've also transformed the podcast a little bit. When I started, it was I would take all comers if you wanted to be on the podcast, didn't matter. You could have a following of four people. You could have a, a following of like 40,000 people. And I liked that. Like I liked talking to uh, meat and potatoes. Like this is what I do in my classroom. I've never told anyone about it before, but I think it's really good mm -hmm. to someone who is very polished and knew how to interview and that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of like content, I've gone from really taking anything because at the beginning I was like, I just want to know about education. What are people doing? What does a classroom look like in North Carolina versus in Washington state, like versus Australia? Um, we're now, because I am focused academically more on language learning and language acquisition, I really narrowed in my focus to look at talking to language teachers but when it comes to overall like school community things like trauma informed teaching, engagement, that kind of thing, I'm still like anyone who comes from any background, I want to hear from you because it's all applicable. Now, how did you get to that? Was that because that's where your heart decided to go? Or was that from looking at your listeners, your analytics? And you just, I mean, some people, me included, say, 
I'm going to find this top like that. That's how I got into doing this particular show. Yeah. I want to talk to podcasters about podcasting. And some people will say, no, you look at your analytics and that's where your audience is. Give them more of it. So do you have a flip on that one? I, it was a little bit of both. I'd say I knew going into it pretty quickly that being specific was better for growing an audience because I would see, especially as my episodes grew you know, where you'd see someone downloaded the most recent episode and then they'd go back and find related episodes. And then that's last you might've seen from that listener. And so I knew that for growing an audience, specificity was definitely there. But at the time, my heart was telling me, I just want to talk to people. That's all I want to do. I want to talk to everybody. And then as my my heart and my passion really narrowed down and i felt like that first mission of talking from everyone to you know your kindergarten to your post secondary teacher uh in all sorts of different uh disciplines where i was sort of like my my network is also narrowing whereas i'm become i'm going to language conferences i'm engaged in language twitter I'm coming across all of these people that I really want to talk to. And so that narrowed it for me. All right. Let's jump back into some of the nerd stuff here. If we of can. course. Publishing. Um, what is your website platform of choice and why? So my website platform of choice has been Squarespace. Um, I don't know if it's because every podcast that I listen to have advertises Squarespace. And so it's like <laughs> earwormed its way in there, but I, I have really liked it. Um, I use on my main page of lessonimpossible.com. I have a page for the podcast, a page for the blog. For the podcast, it was really important to me to find, um, I wanted to have like an agent little profile picture that people could click on versus just a, um, a list. And so, and that actually came from a non-education podcast. There's podcasts by Allie Ward called Ologies and I loved her homepage. And so I was like, I want something like this. So I went and looking for a platform that allowed me to do that. And then having the the blog be hosted on the same uh, has also been really good. So I've, I've enjoyed Squarespace. I don't find it as intuitive as people seem to think that it is, um, but there's some really good explainer videos. So can't go wrong with those. What is your graphics creation platform of choice? So I actually, I made a graphic. My um, my husband looked at it and he's like, that's lovely, sweetheart. <laughs> um, maybe for your birthday, we'll get a graphic designer. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually, I used a graphic des- designer, uh, shout out to Guava Boy. And it was on, I forget the platform, but it was, it was not super expensive. I gave an idea. I was like, explained what I was looking for. And then within 24 hours, like, boom, it was there. So I know. So Guava Boy did your logo. Guava Boy did my logo. Who do, And do you have, does he do your weekly no, that's me. And this is kind of embarrassing, but that's done in uh, preview. So like, really? Yeah, I just do it in preview uh, on the Mac, just text on and logos. And yeah. 11 and a half years. I have never had the answer of I make graphics and Apple preview. This is a first. That is really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I've also never had anybody do graphics through Guava Boy. So that's really cool too. (laughs) Shout out to Apple Preview and hashtag Guava Boy. Now we had this conversation before we hit the record button and so many content creators out there are looking to figure out what the social media game is. And I'm one of those going, yep, Twitter is doing things but that's where my platform is and that's what that's where my automations are and that's even though i'm starting to read things like here's the new twitter and here's the this and you know i'm sitting here going do i need to start making tiktoks for i i don't know will anybody listen to a teacher cast tiktok of aviva saying guava boy for an hour <laughs> i don't know but What's your thoughts on social media? Do you have a plot? I mean, obviously, like we're all audio based. I get that. But I mean, are you mostly on Facebook with your 
spy community? Are you mostly on Twitter? Are you building out of YouTube? Like where, where do you focus on things? I'd say that Twitter has been my main platform and for a variety of reasons, one of which is that I I feel like I've really built a community. So either a community of fellow educational podcasters and it's like through TikTok that I, I met other educational podcasters, uh, particularly on professional development who then hosted what's now become an annual podcasting event, which is Edupodlooza every June. And like that wouldn't have happened without Twitter. Um, I also, I am very, as much as podcasting is a an audio medium, the actual written format of Twitter, I like. Um, I have links to Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn um, and try and sprinkle around there. But I certainly am there to like drop in, do a bit of promo, leave. And I think the fact that my engagement is the highest on Twitter is a testament that I'm actually there. I'm not just being like, hey, listen to my episode and then leaving. Like I'm on Twitter, genuinely liking things, engaging in comments, getting into debates that I probably, where I should just put down my phone and and walk away and be a normal person. Um, so I, I don't know what the alternative to that is going to be. Um, I know Mastodon has been thrown around, but there's a lot of negatives to that as well, particularly the siloing. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed about Twitter as a platform has been the fact that I'm getting and being exposed to things and t-shirts that yeah. I wouldn't normally be. It's an interesting conversation that's starting to come up on a few of my episodes here of, you know, Twitter and your political views, Twitter and your worldviews, all that stuff aside, is there a need to have a conversation of the fact that this is crumbling so many educators PLN spaces? And if you decide to leave because of whatever reason possible, that now breaks all of our PLNs because you're no longer there contributing to our space or our community. And then where is that going to? And, and that's, that's a bigger conversation than you and I right now. Maybe one day when it's Aviva and Jeff and Guava Boy, we'll, we'll come together <laughs> with something in there. But well, um, I am curious what your plan is, because I know that you're also a very Twitter-centric person. That's a great question. I See, my problem with all of this is I don't like the editing process. And because I don't like the editing process, everything that I do has to be created in a way that I can quickly edit and produce and, 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 and push out, right? And all of that is centered on the fact that I'd rather be working with my kids. So all of the content that I push out, whether it be audio, video, whatever, is purposely done in a way so that way I can get back to being a dad. Yeah. That being said, when I'm looking at the fact that if, over the last month, I redesigned TeacherCast from the ground up, streamlined it, probably deleted about 60, I'm not kidding, 60 pages of content. So that way you as my user can find things what you need and make sure it's all happy, but I don't have to manage it all. There is something about the fact that if I do want to go on to a TikTok or a, even YouTube shorts, right? Like if I wanted to take this episode and cut you up for a minute and that's it, I now have to spend more time in the editing room. And that scares me because to make a one minute audio sample of, of you and I here, that might take me 20 minutes. Yeah. And, and that's 20 minutes that I, I'll never get back from the kids. And that's just a big thing. When you're dealing with all of these other platforms, we're not at the point yet through APIs where you can, at least that I know, that you can auto schedule your TikToks, right? Like I know even my platform is, you know, the big Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. I don't have a button that says auto schedule shortened content videos right so i'm really looking at youtube as being a platform um the, the monetization stream for me has been set up and and has been wonderful and my thought is if i can double that through x y and z um 
that's how I'm going to look to support the kids. TikTok is never going to be supporting my kids. So I, I, need to, <laughs> I, I need to look at this from where are the people, where are the marketers, where's the conference people, my audience as, as you know, is not just teachers, not just coaches. We all have a market of who in ed tech wants to find us also. So we need to make sure that we're always being visible. So I, I've been thinking about that a lot. I don't want to turn myself into an editor. I think for me, the content will speak for itself. And I still need to be able to, to edit in five to 15 minutes because I'm not going to be spending time away from the kids just to make a one minute video that may or may not X, Y, and Z. Yeah, very but fair. That, but that's my choice, right? I also have clients that I edit their stuff and I am making those one minute videos. Yeah. So I, I know what it takes to put it together. I know what it's, I have all the templates made. To do it for them is supporting my kids. To do it for me is not. Yeah. So those are my thoughts on all of that stuff. And and if you're out there listening, I'd love to hear from you too. That's why we do this show. That's why we bring on podcasters to talk about podcasting and all of that other stuff. And if you'd like to be featured on this show, I am all about this. I'm glad that you're all listening. Um, you know, we did 50 some episodes pre pandemic and I got a lot more lined up to go. So I'm glad that you guys are here to start this. Aviva, you and I can talk about this subject forever, but I'm feeling the, the don't, 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 don't come back <laughs> on. And, and I want to give you a chance really to, to kind of help me wrap this up. What advice do you have for anybody who's either looking to get into podcasting, using podcasts in their classroom, or just looking to improve their game in 2023? Listen and do what interests you. If it feels like a slog, it's probably not going to be interesting to other people. And if you aren't enjoying it, other people aren't going to enjoy it. So, so follow where your heart's telling you to go, I think is my advice. Where can we go to get a hold of you? Uh, lessonimpossible.com is where the website is. And I've got links to all the ways you can contact me, whether it's like we said, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, etc. I'm going to make sure that we have links to all of these things and also where you can find Guava Boy on our show notes. <laughs> this is Educational Podcasting Today, episode number 57. And if you'd like to be featured on this, please feel free to reach on out over to teachercast.net forward slash contact. We'd love to have you guys on. We are just getting back started. And if you have questions that you'd like answered, just bring those over. We'd happy to do a show on that topic too, even if you're not quite yet keen on sitting down. And that wraps up this episode of Educational Podcasting today. My goodness, it feels good to say that. It's great to have this show back on. On behalf of Aviva and everybody here on TeacherCast, my name is Jeff Bradbury, rem reminding you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions on your podcasts. You've been listening to the TeacherCast Educational Network, hosted by Jeff Bradbury. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at TeacherCast or online at www.teachercast.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App 